So I'm glad to see all of you here. Good afternoon. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, so I'm glad you guys are here to listen to it. We're going to be talking about the differences between different positive airway pressure therapies in heart failure and how sleep disorder breathing presents in heart failure. So as you guys know, um, heart failure is a pretty prevalent condition. The last American Health Association survey that came out in 2013 showed that about 5.1 million people have heart failure, and this was back in 2006. The data is not updated as yet. Um, the incidence is increasing, so are hospitalizations. And to try and differentiate between heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction, so about 40 to 60 percent of patients have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and the others have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There have been two large U.S. studies. Uh, one was about 100 patients, another 108 patients, that studied patients who had uh, both sleep apnea and heart failure, uh, or uh, that had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They were looking for the prevalence of sleep apnea. And what they found was the prevalence of sleep apnea is 49 to 61%, and 31 to 37% of them had central sleep apnea versus 12 to 30 percent of them had obstructive sleep apnea. On the other hand, when another study was conducted in the U.S. on 244 patients, looking at the prevalence of sleep apnea in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, definition was the same. AHI was f over 15 an hour. Um, they found that 48% of them had sleep apnea, and about the same numbers had central and obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a little bit different depending on whether you have reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. This is a pooling of all of the studies um, done worldwide. So the US, UK, Germany, and Portugal. And what you what they found, and they're looking at just regular old heart failure, uh, both with low ejection fraction in blue and um, preserved ejection fraction in red. And the prevalence of sleep apnea is about the same, but the prevalence of central sleep apnea tends to be higher in those with a low ejection fraction than, low, than those with a high ejection fraction. The prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is about the same, maybe a little bit higher in those with a preserved ejection fraction. So why are we talking about this? Why is sleep apnea important? There are so many consequences of sleep apnea. There is intermittent hypoxia and reoxygenation, hypocapnia, hypercapnia. Patients with Heart failure tend to have a lower ejection fraction if they're untreated for sleep apnea, whether it's obstructive or central. Patients tend to have excessive arousals. They have lighter stages of sleep, so a lot of patients with sleep apnea may never reach REM sleep. Also, there's large negative swings in intrathoracic pressure, so you can imagine this affects one's preload, one's afterload, and there is higher mortality, hospitalizations, and morbidity in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea. So what happens when we treat patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with CPAP? So this was um, done on 29 patients who had an ejection fraction on average in the 20s, and eight of them had obstructive sleep apnea, 21 of them had central sleep apnea, and you can see they were in the severe range in terms of their apnea hypopnea index. When the obstructive sleep apnea patients were treated, their AHI dropped completely, their oxygen saturations improved, their wake after sleep onset improved, their sleep efficiency improved. Great. CPAP works for obstructive sleep apnea and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. When they studied the 21 patients who had central sleep apnea, on the other hand, there, they found that nine patients, and these are the nine patients, had reduction in their apnea hypopnea index perfectly. 
and their oxygenation improved. Uh, the findings were similar to those with obstructive sleep apnea. However, 57% of them who were not presented on this graph were non-responders. And so tuck that in the back of your head in that we need other therapies to treat patients who have heart failure with CSA. So CPAP, in obs CPAP use in obstructive sleep apnea has been shown to improve left ventricular ejection fraction, blood pressure, it decreases hospitalizations, it decreases mortality. In this large study that was done uh, looking at Medicare claims data, they looked at patients who had heart failure and then they were tested, diagnosed, and treated for obstructive sleep apnea and not tested, diagnosed, and treated for sleep apnea. And you, could, it's, you know, the mortality is significantly impacted if they're not treated. On the other hand, what happens with central sleep apnea? So um, this is a multi-center Canadian trial that was done uh, in CSA patients with an ejection fraction of less than 40%. And they randomized them to either a control group or CPAP. And what you'll see here is that the apnea hypopnea index is significantly lower in the CPAP group. The left ventricular ejection fraction is improved in the CPAP group, and oxygenation is improved in the CPAP group. Interestingly, the study did not show a statistically significant improvement in mortality in patients who were treated with CPAP. In fact, earlier on in the trial, they showed perhaps CPAP might be detrimental to patients with heart failure. <laughs> and so there was a post hoc analysis performed in this study, and they subcategorized those patients into, well, they had central sleep apnea, and they were randomized to CPAP, but was their AHI actually under control? And so when, and so they, they found that the control group was about the same, the patients who had um, prescribed CPAP, there was about a half of them had their AHI suppressed. However, 47% of them had their AHI unsuppressed. And when they accounted for this difference, they had statistically significant improvement in mortality in patients who had central sleep apnea with reduced ejection fraction who are treated on, adequately treated on CPAP. So it works as long as we get that AHI under control. And then they looked at the same thing with left ventricular ejection fraction and, and if, the C, if the AHI was suppressed then the ejection fraction was also improved. And so there comes the question of we need to get this AHI under control and maybe it doesn't work for central sleep apnea in patients with CPAP. And so that's where adaptive servoventilation comes into place. Adaptive, servo adaptive servoventilation offers anticyclic inspiratory positive airway pressure depending on what the patient is doing and also offers a backup rate. The older ASV devices did not provide uh, and auto titrating expiratory positive airway pressure, but the newer devices do, do. We'll get into that a little bit later. And so there was a study done on about 14 patients, and they looked at the AHI improvement with adaptive servoventilation versus CPAP versus other bi level devices, and oxygen, and ASV was superior to all of the above. There have also been multiple studies done looking at biomarkers of heart failure, such as the BNP, mortality, hospital admissions, and left ventricular ejection fraction, and they're all improved with adaptive servoventilation. And until lately, that was the standard of care for patients with central sleep apnea. But then in 2015 came the SURVE-HF trial, 
And they randomized a little over 1,300 patients to either ASV or to medical therapy. And what they and what and these patients had primarily central sleep apnea. Their ejection fraction was less than 45 percent. And what they found was that the patients who were on ASV compared to control had an increased overall mortality and an overall cardiovascular mortality when compared to the control group. And so this was a game changer in sleep medicine. And since then, adaptive servoventilation is contraindicated in patients with an ejection fraction less, than 40, less or equal to 45%. Now, there were several issues with the SERVE-HF trial. It was an old device. Uh, they used the auto-CS device, which does not have a variable EPAP. So you can imagine, if you don't have a variable EPAP, the only thing the ASV device can do is go up on the IPAP to treat an obstruction. If you're going up on the IPAP to treat an obstruction, you're going to overventilate the patient. And if you overventilate the patient, you may cause hypocapnia. If you cause hypocapnia, you may cause hypokalemia. If you cause hypokalemia, there is a possibility that you might trigger arrhythmias. And so um, there were other issues with the study. The residual AHI varied between patients. Also, about almost 30% of the patients either discontinued or never used the device. And so there were multiple issues with that study. So our lab did a study and tried to figure out whether is this a class effect of all adaptive servoventilators or is it a device effect? And so what we did is we randomized about 14 patients with ejection fraction over 40% and complex sleep apnea to four nights of polysomnography. And each of those nights, they were randomized to a different device. And those devices included the ResMed S7, the ResMed S9, the Philips Respironic System 1, and the Philips Respironic Stream Station. And the settings were standard and were consistent for all of the devices. We excluded patients with other sleep disorders that were untreated. And what we found is that, so this is uh, minute ventilation, respiratory rate times tidal volume on the y-axis. And this is the S7 device. There was a statistically significant increase in minute ventilation during wake in patients with the S7 device. And if you looked at the overall night summary in terms of minute ventilation, it was much higher with the S7 device when compared to the other devices. We also noticed that these patients had, the S7 compared to the S9 had a higher respiratory rate, and they were also providing higher pressure support. So maybe it's not class specific, but it's device specific. And so we've, we've just talked about this, in that hypocapnia can lead to hypokalemia, which can lead to QT interval changes on the ECG. This is a well-known pathway, and it's been shown in, uh, in other studies, not sleep apnea related. And so we looked at our patients, and we, we were trying to figure out, well, our QTs, given that S, the X7 seems to be overventilating the patients. Does it have any impact on the QTC in these patients? So the QT interval corrected for heart rate was not different for the S7 device, even though um, the overall averages were higher for the S7 device, and we'll, we'll go through that in just a minute. But is, you can imagine, would this be amplified in someone with heart failure? The heart failure patients are on loop diuretics. They already have metabolic alkalosis at baseline. They may be hypokalemic at baseline as a, a, a part of being on the loop diuretics. And so are they more susceptible to this? That question is still open to be answered. <coughs> 
the S7 device, the patients did have more premature ventricular contractions. That wasn't statistically significant. We also, show, we also saw a few more events of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in patients with the S7 device. And on one night, one of the System 1 patients also had a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia episode. None of this was statistically significant. Our study was very small. And so this is a summary. We've talked about most of this. If you, and it's, it's showing average, averages and standard deviations. And if you just glance at it, you'll notice that the awake, vol the awake tidal volumes are higher for the S7 device. And the other things that we haven't talked about is that, uh, oh, the, so the awake volumes are higher for the S7 device. And you'll also see that the S7 device QT intervals tends to hang out more so in the 400 millisecond range versus the other ones in the 300 millisecond range. Again, it wasn't statistically significant. And then in terms of sleep architecture, for some reason, the patients were awake a, a, a lot more than on the S9 device compared to the other devices. So that's it about uh, adaptive servo ventilation. I want to share a st as an unpublished study with you um, that we did looking at the Truven Healthcare database. And they uh, collect information from all sorts of insurance companies. And there was over a million patients. And we were looking at outcomes in patients with heart failure who were diagnosed with sleep apnea based on whether they were treated with a device or not treated with a device. And so we included patients who were over the age of 21 and they had to have had health plan coverage for at least 12 months before they were diagnosed with sleep apnea and six months after they were diagnosed with sleep apnea because of those were the time points we were looking at. And so we had several thousands of patients included in the analysis. The, there are about 12,000 patients on BiPAP, 2,700 on BiPAP ST, and 57,000 on CPAP. And then the untreated patients were about 73,000. And on average, the patients who were on the BiPAP ST device were a little bit older, as we would expect. And the control groups were also a little bit older. Males were highly represented in the study, which is not atypical. And as we would imagine, the patients who on the BiPAP ST device had more cardiovascular more, uh, comorbidities, and the ones on the BiPAP S device had more pulmonary comorbidities. And overall, what we found was that regardless of which device they were prescribed, they had reduced number of any hospitalizations and heart failure related hospitalizations when compared to the control group. And then we differentiated between obstructive, central, and then mixed obstructive and central sleep apnea. And there was still a statistically significant improvement in patient outcomes if they were pre prescribed either a BiPAP ST, BiPAP S device, or a CPAP device compared to a control group. And th these were all adjusted for propensity scores, age, sex, and medical comorbidities, including medications. And so to summarize, I think I'm just hitting my 30 minute mark. Um, sleep apnea is very prevalent among patients who have heart failure. Central sleep apnea is more prevalent in patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction compared to those who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. CPAP therapy works for both obstructive and central sleep apnea in patients with heart failure. However, it might not be effective for all the central sleep apnea patients. Insurance claims data have shown that PAP therapy is superior to no PAP therapy in patients with sleep apnea. And then finally, currently, ASV is contraindicated in those 
with an ejection fraction less than 45% until we have more information.